And today is a very significant time in Irish history. And we all should be proud of the men, and especially the women, that took part. I know this is unusual to ask this, but I would like to have a moment of silence for these next few people, the men and women who fought in Easter week, especially for Margaret Keogh, a nurse who was killed, the only woman that was killed. I'd like to pray for the women of Cleveland, especially a national officer of the Hibernians, Adele Christie, who took part from 1900 to like 1922. She was against the treaty and took on the role of Americans Associations of the Anti-Treaty League. She took a big part in that. So I'd like to remember her. I'd like to remember also the rest of the ladies, ancient order of Hibernian, are deceased, who always had freedom for all Ireland as their goal. I'd also like to thank all the men and women of the Irish Northern Aid, and in particular, John Campbell, who kept the fight alive here in Cleveland. So if we can all just have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. I'd like to share why I chose some of the posters I did. And I can't, could not have done them without John's artistic help. We wanted to highlight the women of, and I'm sorry, I am not a Gaelic speaker, so I probably will mispronounce, Inanna Erin, the women, the daughters of Erin. They were the, one of the first organizations after the Land League, which Anne Parnell took part of, that decided there was also a cultural revolution in Ireland at the time, and they wanted to teach the young children their history, their song, their music of Ireland. Those women under Maud Gaughan did amazing work. And I'd like to use some of their own quotes from in their own voice. Maud Gaughan, or I'm sorry, the founder, Senator uh, Weiss Power, she wrote The Political Influence of Women. She wants to thank the Gaelic League because due to them, it was the credit of having established the first Irish National Society which accepted women as members on the same term as the men. Now Maud Gaughan, speaking of her organization, she says, the Inanna never lost sight of the fact that the objects of the society were not merely cultural and educational, but to work for the complete independence of Ireland. So all children attending our classes were pledged never to enlist in the British Army or Navy before the end of the first year, we had started to fund for organizing a National Boys Brigade to prevent enlistments and receive a generous subscriptions from my sisters of the Ladies Auxiliary at that time of the Ancient Order of Hibernians in Suffolk County, New York. Unfortunately, this plan did not come to light right away. It took nine years, and then the Vienna Aaron were formed with Constant Markovitz. The next organization, which is, should be dear to all of our hearts, is the Kamana Bond. They were founded April 2nd, 1914 in Wynn Hotel. They are the most significant women's organization over the last century because they never lost their goals for an all republic of Ireland. And I'd like to quote Constance Markovitz. Fix your mind on the ideal of Ireland free with her women enjoying the full rights of citizenship in their own nation, and no one will be able to sidetrack you, and so make use of you to use up the energies of the nation in obtaining all sorts of concessions. Concessions, too, that for the most part were coming in the national course of evolution, and were perhaps just hastened a few years by the fierce agitation to obtain them. She goes on to say, to sum up in a few words what I want the young Ireland women to remember from me. Regard yourselves as Irish, believe in yourself as Irish, as units of a nation distinct from England, your conqueror, and as determined to maintain your distinctiveness and gain your deliverance. Arm yourselves with weapons to fight your nation's cause. Arm your souls with noble and free ideas. Arm your minds with the histories and memories of your country and her martyrs, her language, 
and a knowledge of her arts and her industries. And if in your day the call should come for you, for your body to arm, do not shrink from that either. May this aspiration towards life and freedom among the women of Ireland bring forth a Joan of Arc to free our nation. Those two organizations were very special in this movement. And when Easter Sunday came around and Ian McNeil decided that he was going to call off when he found that there was a rebellion, these women were sent by the seven signatures to go around the country and say, we are doing it tomorrow. A lot of these women took their lives in their hands to go around the country and never made it back to Dublin to participate in the fight that they really wanted to. We have over here under number five, we have the Irish women rise in 1916. We have a list, there was over 200 women who participated in every garrison except where De Valera led. He did not let the ladies in. The proclamation was all, also very unique in history. It was the first proclamation that our own first lady would have been very proud of. And when I'm talking about our first lady, I'm talking about Abigail Adams, when she told her husband John, don't forget the ladies. These seven signatures did not forget the ladies. They put Irish men and Irish women in the proclamation. A woman that I admire is Scottish born. Her name is Margaret Skinner. She would come, her parents were Irish born, she would come back and forth between Scotland and Ireland and bring detonators. And her and Constant Markowitz would go out in the hills around Dublin to shoot these off and make sure that they were working. During the week, she would dress up as a boy, ride her bike to carry dispatches between all the garrisons. That was not enough for her. Constance Markowitz knew that this was not enough for her. And she, as the second in command of St. Stephen's Green, asked the commander, Malin, if Margaret Skinner could participate fully. He agreed. She was able to get a uniform. When she would put that uniform on, she'd go up and be a sniper. Then she would take it off, put on her boy's outfit, and go ahead and go be a courier. She came back to Malin and said, you know, we're, we're being shot at by the Shelbourne Hotel. I know how we can stop that. He was afraid to put her out there. He said, your idea is good, but I just can't chance it. So he gave her another idea because she had told him, listen, I am in this like the men. We are in it together. I want to fully participate, and he allowed her. So her and three other men went out to try to bomb so that they could get into the shelter. Unfortunately, when one of the guys was getting in, breaking into this building, his gun went off, signaled that these people were down there. She was shot. She was shot three times in the rib and two times in the leg. But that didn't stop her. She didn't give up. They had to drag her to a hospital. And from the hospital, they took her to prison. And that's another thing. She was one of 77 women that were put into prison. So it wasn't just the men that went to prison. There was one whole garrison that all the leaders throughout when they surrendered went out, they wanted the women to leave. There was 22 in one garrison that said, we are with the men, we are marching out with the men, and they all went to prison with the men. In the GPO, the women were only agreed to go because they had to take the wounded to a hospital. Three women stayed behind, Elizabeth O'Farrell, Winnie Kearney, and right now my mind went blank. Um, I'll tell you in a minute when she was a <laughs> But Elizabeth O'Farrell was chosen to go out and take the surrender to everyone, and she was airbrushed out of history. 
Now as a Hibernian and as a woman, I'm proud of the fact that young women were committed to this cause. And we have a commemorative pin that highlights Molly O'Reilly. At the age of nine, Molly O'Reilly went to Liberty Hall to learn Irish dancing. She attended some speeches of James Connolly, was inspired by him, and decided this was what she wanted to do. Her father was a supporter of the Crown. Unbeknownst to him, his daughter Molly was in all these nationalist activities. And when the Hoff guns came in, Molly hid some under her father's bed. <laughs> she was chosen by James Connolly to raise the flag, the green flag, over Liberty Hall on Palm Sunday. So she was a very remarkable young lady. You know, everyone thinks about Constance Markowitz, and yes, she did a lot, but it was the people that she influenced. She was a good friend of Kathleen Lynn, who turned out to be a chief medical officer, who was the other person that was in the GPO. We also have James Connolly's daughters, Winnie and Ina, and they were upset because they were down with Constance Markowitz when the boat came in with the host guns, and they were the only two girls in Belfast, they had a girls' society like the Nathiana for the boys. And they were down there with them when all the boys left, and they were upset, Ina especially. And her sister says, don't show them how you really feel. Show yourself like a soldier. Once beknownst to them, they had a special mission. The two of them took the guns from the house up to Belfast. So again, remarkable women. And you know, it was a woman's idea to bring the guns from Germany using yachts. It was Mary Spring Rice. And the boat that they used was a, a wedding present, present to Molly Esther, who was born in the um, United States. So, Two women were on that boat that brought those guns that were used. Because we all know the story about Roger Caseman and how they got caught and the guns that were coming in were all sunk. So it was these women that did an awful lot, and I think we owe them a lot of gratitude. And I want to thank everyone for being here tonight to honor the women and the men of 1916 because they were the ones that gave us the beginning of the country that we all love as a true republic. Hopefully we'll all be united pretty soon.